Welcome to another episode of Behind the Velvet Rope. I'm your host, Arthur Cade, and during the next half hour, we will take you behind the scenes at the most talked about events in TV, film, sports, and fashion. We will take you on the red carpet of two of the year's most buzzed about films, chat with one of the world's top athletes, give you a special behind the scenes look at the hottest fashion show on the planet, and bid a fond farewell to one of TV's most beloved shows. So come with us behind the velvet rope. It's not every day that you get to go behind the scenes at the world's most famous fashion show. We went backstage at the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show where we caught up with the angels, then off to the pink carpet to talk with the celebrity attendees. This is how crazy it is, guys. It's absolutely insane. All right, guys, so we're in line right now. We're waiting for Adriana Lima, the queen. I mean, she has a hairnet on and she's still drop dead gorgeous. How amazing. Backstage at the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show. After all these years, does it still blow your mind to still be doing this and see how big it's gotten? I feel so honored to still hear my 16th show out of 20. This is crazy. I did not thought that I would last this long <laughs> in my life and that I could keep up too. What's the secret? How have you lasted this long and how have you kept up? Mom and Dad. <laughs> Good genes. The Limas. Ah, oh, the Limas. <laughs> Thank you. To see the, the training that you guys have, how well you know your products, how has it changed you as a business person? So when you do walk away from Victoria's Secret, how has it changed you to go into the world and do something else? Well, I plan to be an actress. And you're going to be a good one at that. I hope so. I will see. I will see if I have talent, but uh, that's my plan. This is so crazy. As you can see, you got to pan around. I mean, it is insane in here. The girls are all getting ready. Everyone's looking gorgeous. They have no makeup on and they're still the most gorgeous women on earth. It's just incredible. You've got some young bucks joining the group this year. Gigi, Kendall, as someone who's done this and been so successful with it, what advice do you have for the younger models coming in? Well, have fun, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's the Victoria's Secret fashion show. It's not like a serious fashion show. So you can smile, you can laugh, you can send kisses, you can wave to people, you can wink. You can do whatever you want on that runway. So have a lot of fun. It seems like it gets bigger and bigger every year. Does it still blow your mind to see how big the show has become and getting? Well, I, you know, it's hard to believe that it's getting bigger and bigger, but every time I come backstage, it's like crazy. And the outfits, when we get to try like all these incredible wings, like I don't know how they have like such an imagination that, you know, like that makes it like everything so incredible. And I think the talent, all the people performing, it, that helps it too, you know, to make the show like the biggest show on earth. We've got Lily Aldridge right behind us. We're going to be interviewing her next. She's wearing the fantasy bra. First of all, how cool is it you're wearing the fantasy bra this year? It is amazing. It's a dream come true and such an honor. It's a big deal for the girls to get the fantasy bra, so I'm very thankful. How do you get notified? Does a phone call come in, an email? What happens? There was actually this big elaborate hoax and like plot and decoys, and um, I think it'll be on this special, so you have to tune in and watch how I got how I got surprised getting the fantasy bra it was really sweet. One. We're now going to be talking to Stella Maxwell. I mean, my job is really hard sometimes. How does the second show and the nerves differ from the first show? Are you less nervous? I mean, I still have my little butterflies. Even right now, I'm like, ooh. I'm like a little bit like I'm. I'm just anxious to start. I just want to. I just want to. You know, put on my wings, put on my um, my outfit, and feel good. Who did you idolize growing up? Which one of these girls did you look up to while you were forming yourself in the industry? Um, I was always a big fan of Candace. I was always looking at her. I just think she's got a beautiful body, and I love how she models. I love how she moves her body, and I think she's just a good inspiration for all the girls. From backstage to the pink carpet, our day continues as we talk to some of the celebrity guests in attendance at this one-of-a-kind event. First yeah. of all, your suit, awesome. Yeah, nice shirt, nice color. Yeah. See, it's, a, it's about the colors. I'm getting, I'm getting compliments. I see, Tyson back for me, I always wear black, so I said, okay, let me break it up. You know, <laughs> it, it, see, if it's not black, it's white, so 
I try to break it up in between, shock them. And it's the best place to shock them. Almost, this almost. This is your I'm thing, by the way. Actually, You're always here. me standing here, I'm a little brighter, so that looks a little dull, so yeah. As someone who's had such a successful modeling career, what does it take to be a successful model in today's day and time? You gotta, you gotta definitely be in shape. You gotta take care of yourself, and you gotta want it, and you gotta work hard. Nothing, nothing that any one of these girls are here got it for free or easy, you know? So there might be some people say otherwise, but you know, it's hard to get here. It really is. What brings you to the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show? Is that a real question? Yes. <laughs> is it like a, is it, that's a general question? That you, it was you're asking joking, everybody half joking, half serious, half ironic. That's what brought me here. Are you kidding? That's what brings yeah. all of us here. Yeah, you, are you serious? You're yeah. a fan, I'm it's, guessing. It's a great brand. <laughs> great brand recognition, that's what it is. Proud mama here right now. Congratulations. Hashtag, Hashtag proud mama. Talk to me about having your daughter modeling in the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show. It's going to be such a thrill. You know, it's it's probably the most exciting day of her life for sure. And I'm just very, you know, I feel very blessed that I can be here and be part of it and witness this amazing day. you got to be yeah. a fan, I'm guessing. Yeah, big fan. I've got some friends who are in the show, so I'm excited to check them who out. Who are your friends? Uh, Romy is a good friend of mine. Uh, Bridget Malcolm, who's walking this year. And a friend of mine, Kelly Gale, who's walked the past two years. She's not here tonight, but, uh, but I'm here, you know, she's here in spirit. So. And they need to get you to perform at this show next year. What that's do you think? I'm, that's what I'm saying, man. You need to be here, like, negotiating. That's exactly like, what I'm saying. I'm going to make some plays tonight. <laughs> You're a fan of Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, I'm of guessing. Course. Yeah, absolutely. Who, who's your favorite angel? Um, I mean, there's just so many. I don't I don't really know too many angels, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to learn some some new faces tonight, for sure. You're always... Um, Candace Swanpool. Um, Kendall Jenner. <laughs> Well, I, I was around from the from the season. I, I haven't left New York, so I think for me, you know, coming to, to some popular events is, is fun and, and uh, get to let, let my hair down a little bit and, and enjoy some some fun times. Victoria's Secret fan, I'm guessing. Huge Victoria's Secret fan. I'm wearing a lot of Victoria's Secret right now. <laughs> I, lo I love. I, I'm. I got to come. I sort of came in the like snuck in a couple years ago, sort of. I got a ticket. But um, I had no idea what I was in for. And so now this year I'm like, I'm amped, I'm ready, I can't wait to, to watch the show. It's such a beautiful show. It's glitter everywhere. It's magic. Lily Aldridge has quite an exciting night tonight. Because of you, you designed the fantasy bra. Talk to me about the, the thoughts and the inspiration behind designing it. The bra this year is inspired by fireworks. It's called the Fireworks Fantasy Bra. It's worth $2 million. It took about 700 hours to produce. It features 6,800 stones, 1,300 carats, diamonds colored gemstones. It's a spectacular piece. It took about four months with 12 pressmen. It's one of the most critically acclaimed movies of the year, featuring a star-studded cast and tackling the true story of how the Boston Globe uncovered the massive scandal and cover-up within the Catholic Archdiocese. Spotlight delivers on the hype. See what the cast had to tell us at the New York premiere. Mark Ruffalo, first of all, congratulations on such an incredibly powerful movie. Thank what you. drew you to telling the story? Uh, the script and uh, the story itself. Um, it's just an important story and it's, an, and it's coming out of a time where I think culturally we're ready to really have this conversation. I think the church is, uh, with this new pope, is in a place that maybe they can uh, start to right some of the wrongs that were committed here. I mean, it's a story about rape of children and the, and the, and the massive cover-up by the, by the Catholic Church all the way up to the Vatican. And, and we don't know how long this has been going on, but there's been no justice. And so when I read that and I project myself into where the world's going to be two years after we shoot it, it felt like the right place to be at the right time, and I was lucky to be there. It's hard to believe it even happened, and it's probably still happening today. It's crazy. I don't think it's hard to believe it happened. It's been going on for centuries. Not to correct you, but I'm afraid <laughs> no, I must. Right, uh, it has, and um, uh, although that's in no way a condemnation of every priest or every Catholic or every bishop or the Catholic Church as a whole, it's a, it's a condemnation of uh, a systemic uh, uh, issue 
perpetrated by a large number of people within that institution. So um, the fact that that the Boston Globe broke the story, the fact that this this movie is highlighting it once again, I think is really important. You've done everything in your career. What specifically drew you to this story to jump into it? Well, the story itself was incredible to me, um, uh, and uh, it was. I think it was a necessary necessary. Uh, uh, film, to film to make, but also I was I was very attracted to to this the, the way it was being told, and also that that Tom was going to tell it because I'm a big fan of Tom's. What was it about the story that drove you to want to tell it? Um, well, just being a part of anything that's ambitious like this is uh, like the best that you can all offer uh, an actor, whether it's ambitious storytelling, whether it's ambitious in its um, style, and this was telling something that could really help people. So for me, that was like. The chance, one chance in a million. It was Michael Keaton and Tom and um, Mark Ruffalo, so I was lucky as I could be. You know, when you think of a journalist-driven movie, it's not meant to be exciting, but yet this one really flows. Why does this movie flow the way it does? Well, I think it has, uh, you know, the watchword for, for Josh and Tom was also uh, always authenticity. And they made the, the very distinct decision of just letting the process be, and the truth of the process be the story. Uh, and so I, I, always, I always have believed that, especially in film, it's always interesting to watch someone who's an expert at what they do do their job, whether it's making a watch or uh, being an, an extraordinary uh, um, athlete. To see someone do something that you could never do and watch how that is done is always riveting. And in this case, you're watching what is seemingly a very relentless and unsexy job of calling people, vetting a story, uh, you know, on, on the computer, on the phone. But the story that the result of the story is uh, is undeniable. And so, I, I think that I think just being true to what these people do did and do and how they did it is really the, the motor that runs this movie. The incredible thing about the story is the complicity of silence that went on, not just with the church, but the cops, and how much you see what was going on in the community and in Boston. As you dug into it, did it, did it surprise you to even see how deep it ran? Well, it did in the fact that, look, a problem this big, and it is a big crisis, as we now know, uh, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. People have to know. People, and so we raise those questions in the movie. We don't provide answers. We really just raise questions uh, um, uh, that deal with sort of societal complicity and deference. And look, at the end of the day, this is just a really compelling story uh, and a very entertaining one for that reason. It's a, it's interesting subject matter. Did it blow your mind? Because watching this, you almost think something like this couldn't happen in a major metropolitan city, and yet it happened. When, when writing this story, did it, did, it, did it still seem like, holy cow, I can't believe this really happened? I mean, yeah, and the holy cow, I can't believe it's probably still happening in a lot You're of right. places. And, and I think, you know, I think the, the scale and scope of it is pretty enormous. Um, but even within that community, just the scale and the scope. And watching, you know, I think we had the great good fortune of spending a lot of time with these reporters. And really, because that was really the only way to get at the story. And we went back to them time and time again. And they would always talk about how it felt like at first they were opening a box. And then they realized, no, 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 it's a closet. And then they realized, no, 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 it's a room. And then they realized, no, 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 it's a warehouse. Right? That's the way the story unfolded for them. And, and you know, I think to us, you know, it's not only that in terms of how many the number and the system of the church, but also how it encompassed the entire city of Boston. And that, I think, is the thing that is the, is the, real, is the real tragedy and the thing to really think about. After one of the most dominant years in sports history, there is no question that Serena Williams deserved the coveted honor of Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year. We chatted with her, as well as Muhammad Ali legacy winner Jack Nicholas and Sports Illustrated Sports Kid of the Year Reese Whitley at the annual awards gala. Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade. 
What an honor for you. You've had a magnificent year. This has got to be the cherry on top of the cake. What does it mean for you to get Sports Person of the Year from Sports Illustrated? Um, it really means a lot to me. I've never gotten this award, and uh, it just, you know, also being a woman usually doesn't go to a woman, so I think it's just been very, just a couple women before me has gotten it, so that also means a lot, not only to me, but for women in, in the future that are like, oh, you know, I want to I want to do well. I want to be an athlete. I want to be Sports Woman of the Year, so that's what's really exciting. I was watching you at the U.S. Open, and You've had now some time to ch to really reflect on a historical year. Yeah. When you reflect on it, what does it mean to you to, to have gone through what you've gone through? It's been amazing. I mean, winning four in a row. At one point, I was going for five. I never did that before. And then doing it again so late in my career, you know, and then going back to Indian Wells, which was just a great story for me. And um, it's been it's been fun. It's been really, really cool. To, to receive... Uh an award with uh, Ali's name on it is really quite nice. Uh, it's not about necessarily uh, how I hit a golf ball. It's about some of the other things that I did in my career. And it's nice to be honored for those. So uh, I've got great respect for Ali, and uh, you know he's. Uh, we've communicated a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit through the years, and it's uh, it's going to be a nice evening. It's nice to have Lonnie here to present it. Records are meant to be broken. I don't think yours is ever going to be broken. I don't think uh, anyone's touching 18. I don't know. Is it something you want? Is it say, because I wouldn't want my record to be broken, but is it something that you would like to see someone champion that cause and eventually take it? Yeah, well, nobody ever wants their records to be broken. <laughs> I mean, that's that's an obvious. I mean, you know, but I don't, I don't, so, Tiger, I, I called Tiger after uh, uh, when he got hurt last, that's a while, a few years ago when he won, won the U.S. Open. And I said, Tiger, you know, I said, you know, so, you know, you know, and I know that nobody wants your records to be broken, but I don't want you not to be healthy and not have the opportunity to do that. 15 years old. This is, I mean, you've had a short life so far, but this has <laughs> got to be the coolest moment of it, I'm guessing. Oh, I mean, these past couple of months just working with Sports Illustrated Kids and, you know, Good Morning America, um, you know, just these past couple of months have been really cool to go through. Uh, I've never experienced anything like it, so it's all new to me. It's not like you're playing football or basketball. Yeah. You're swimming. I yeah. mean, obviously, Michael Phelps is taking swimming to a global sport. Oh, yeah. But talk to me about being able to carry on that legacy of him, Lochte, and all the greats before you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's I think it's really incredible to see how far the sport has really grown. And, you know, it's still growing, you know, as fast as ever. Um, so I think to be, you know, kind of given that responsibility of, you know, carrying the sport into kind of a new era, um, you know, I think it's going to be really cool to see how that can turn out. After 175 nominations across the Emmys, Golden Globes, SAG Awards, and BAFTAs, Downton Abbey concludes its six-year run as one of the most critically acclaimed shows in television history. We chatted with the cast about the final season and saying goodbye to the iconic show. Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Gates, Hugh Bonneville. Are, is there going to be marital counseling in season six or what? There was some <laughs> issues at the end of season five. Where do we see you guys go in oh, season six? Yeah, well, I think well, Cora and I have found a sort of a, a sort of balance, but uh, she's an independent woman. She's American above all, which is really annoying. And uh, she plows her own furrow, and so uh, Robert has to uh, keep up with the pace because she's determined to cause a bit of friction between, um, well, there's a, there's a storyline involving the, the local village hospital, and uh, my mother sits on one side of the fence, and she sits on, a chorus sits on the other side of the fence, and I sit bang in the middle, trying to keep, um, you know, mother and uh, wife apart, and I'm sure many men will recognize, many uh, husbands <laughs> will recognize that phenomenon. What was it like saying goodbye? What was it last day on set like? It was, it was, it was very touching. It was, uh, you know, we had a lot of goodbyes because not everyone finished on the same day. So we had like 10 days of goodbyes. Um, and uh, my last scene was with Michelle, Lady Mary, and, uh, and Jim Carter, uh, so Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes. And uh, it was, we were reflecting between takes on the fact that Michelle and I did our very first scenes together six years ago. So it was a very uh, bittersweet moment. Do we see the sisters get along in season six? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, 
Edith and Mary have, I mean, that's been one of the sort of through lines of the show. It's been one of the kind of, I mean, for me, certainly, one of the core relationships for Mary. And uh, it's, uh, I don't think that they all ever fully see eye to eye. Um, and that's, you know, for us, it's more fun to play for me and Laura. Um, I think they grow, eventually they kind of mature and um, they, it's, they kind of get on and don't get on on a sort of different level. Working with you, the chemistry between the two of you, I mean, he almost creates this emotionless being, but you know he cares. So talk to me about building that chemistry with you. Uh, well, I've worked with Hugh quite a few times. We've actually played a married couple twice before. How cool. Um, very different kinds of projects, very different kinds of characters. But there's always been something that's been really natural about the two of us together. We don't really need to discuss very much. It just kind of falls into place. Um, and I'm not sure what that's all about. You know, it's, I don't really question it. Um, I just sort of have faith that it's there. What do you think it is about these characters that people really connected with? I think it's the honesty of the writing. I think what Julian portrayed was, as Mrs. Hughes says in one of the scenes last year, warts and all. You saw the good side and the bad side of all of these characters and therefore the audience were allowed to make up their own judgment on who they liked, who they hated and then the way the stories are interwoven you want to see that person fail or you want to see that person succeed so I think it's the fact that it's a story about a hierarchy yet there's no hierarchy in how the story is told so you learn as much about the lord of the manor as you do about the kitchen maid the lowest of the low and I think that means that people can really invest in these in these stories and these characters. Phyllis, he finally popped the question. Congratulations. Oh, <laughs> thank you. You can kiss me if you like. Mwah. Yes, thrilling. And she said yes. She what did. a fool. <laughs> what was it like filming that final episode, saying goodbye? That was, that, that was tough, actually. Um, some of us found it tougher than they expected. I found it as tough as I had expected. Um, but there were tears shed. There were, you know sobbing on people on fellow actors necks and crew you know we were all we were all flooding really <laughs> so jim carter you finally popped the question i was talking to phyllis about it the love affair was finally consummated it took us <laughs> took us five years to get around to it my god we're slow moving talk about a long-term relationship yeah, it, it, it's no different now in england that's that's how we work yeah uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be happy where do we see the two of you moving in season six uh, well, we ended with, the, as you say, popping the question. I, uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about it. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, <laughs> you know. But uh, <laughs> nothing too dramatic. But I think I think people people who've been uh, wanting Carson and Mrs. Hughes to get together, I think they'll be pleased. The show is about the haves and the have-nots. Talk to me about the message of this, the socio-economic message that the show brings to light, because we see the upstairs and the downstairs, obviously, and the servants versus the family. And Talk to me about the message of the show. What it's been very good at showing is um, an aspect of English uh, society at a particular time in the last century. Um, and, you know, I think people are fascinated by the detail. You know, it's, it's a fast, you know, the hierarchies within the household, not just upstairs, but downstairs as well. The fact that, you know, Mr. Carson in the downstairs realm is you know is the top dog and uh, and everybody has to sort of bow and curtsy to him and uh, I think people have been fascinated by the details of that period and the way that people behave uh, it was a much simpler time wasn't it there was no telephones and there was no internet and people talked to one another and uh, you know they weren't doing this all the time <laughs> and um, yeah I think I think people yearn for something simpler don't you agree I do. Few movies this year had a larger social impact than Spike Lee's Chirac. Spike Lee puts a modern twist on an ancient Greek play as a commentary on gun violence in America. See what the cast and director had to tell us at the New York premiere. No one shines a light better on social issues 
better than you, Spike Lee. What made you want to tackle this one? Save lives. That's the everybody worked on this film in front of and behind the camera. I told them from the get-go this film's about saving lives. We want Chicago to know that New York loves them. We got their back and we support them. It's not Knicks Bulls, that's that's nothing to do with life and death. We got we support Chicago. Greek tragedy. Why tell it through a Greek tragedy? How did that idea come about? Satire's been used for over 2,000 years, so that's the best. Kevin Wilmot, the co-writer, that's the best way we felt we could tell this story. No peace, no peace. I like Absolutely. You're a troublemaker in this movie. I have to be. Sometimes you have to rile people's feathers to get stuff done, and that's what Lisa Strada does. She says, you know what, I've had enough. No peace, no peace. So you get the script, and Spike goes, we're making a movie about gun violence, but it's going to be a Greek tragedy. What's your reaction? Spike didn't do that. He just <laughs> sent a script, and I read it on my own, and I, I gathered that as I went along. And then once we finally had a conversation, the first thing he said to me was, we have to save lives. That's the first thing he actually said about the script. So as soon as I was reading and I saw the character Lissa Strata, I was like, oh, OK, I did that play in college. I did not get to play Lissa Strata. But um, so that piqued my interest. And then when I realized it was set in the south side of Chicago, it's like, OK. And then we had that conversation. And I knew for sure that I had to be a part of this. This is a topic that needs to be talked about. Who better to say it than Spike, right? Uh, Spike is the perfect post person to uh, talk about such a potent topic. Uh, and I actually believe that Spike truly has, I say, I don't know if he got a crystal ball or what it is, but, you know, he knows how, how to, to get everybody uh, rallied around the right topics at the right time. Working with him and telling just this socially relevant message, that had to have been incredible. Yeah, and it was my hometown, too, so, uh, and I knew that based on his body of work and, and, his commitment that um, I knew the reason he wanted to do all this and get all these cameras here is to help people save lives, not to you know get anybody rich or to make another uh, film where um, people are reveling in their celebrity. None of that stuff that they accused that uh, the film of being none of that was at its heart and core. Uh, we filmed around St. Sabina Church, and um, it's a it's a wild movie. It's a satire and has wild shifts of tone, but in its heart, it's a uh, very human and, and it's it's basically Spike said to me he said I got something for you Chirac and I went Chirac all right you're coming to Chicago and he says the only reason to make the movie and to get all these cameras here is to stop to help somehow stop end the violence he tells this story in a very unique way the Greek tragedy talk to me about the story time because no one doesn't like Spike hence why he just got the honorary Oscar at the governor's ball the collective body of his all his work uh, I think it's a brilliant idea it's a very artistic, intellectual, and also timely idea, and, and, and a visionary idea to be able to take something that's thousands of years old and see its relevance today. Unfortunately, that there is some relevance. Yes. That's the unfortunate side of it, but from the creative perspective, it's an awesome, uh, it's an awesome ability. I look forward to getting some of that one of these days. Lala, you get to work with the best in the business. <laughs> Spike, no one tells the story better no one. than him. No one. What's no it one. like working with him? I, I just even feel like this is a dream. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm actually in this movie. I'm not just walking the red carpet. I'm in this movie. Um, it was an amazing experience. And Spike was just such an incredible director. I learned so much. So I'm really excited to see it all come together tonight. Gun violence, such a relevant topic in America. Yes. When you get to tell a story that is relevant like this and shines a light on it, it's got to be so powerful you as an actor, powerful for you as an actress. It is powerful. You know, you want to do work that means something. You know, you want to be a part of something that means something. And this movie means something and is shining light on what's happening in Chicago, what's happening in the U.S. and across the globe. So I'm just excited for people to see it and get the conversation started. How proud are you of this woman? I'm proud, man, because I, you know, I, I, I know what. What she go through, I know the hard work that she puts in, the grind that she goes through. So I'm just proud that you know, actually, she could be in a Spike Lee film. You know, I know how much she talk about being in a Spike Lee film, and it finally came to fruition. So gun violence, huge problem, and obviously he shines a, a very important light on this with Chirac. Talk to me about what more can be done right now. Well, I think in this case, you know, when it's life and death, when it's literally a life and death situation, we need to throw every resource, put every spotlight on it. So I don't think that we intend that this movie, uh, by saying that women withholding sex from their men, is going to solve everything. If it's a part of the solution, great. But we also know jobs. We also know job training. We know that uh, proper nutrition, proper education, 
uh, relationships with the church, relationships with law enforcement, all of these things are a part of the solution. Um, so this is one segment of it, but we know that it's a complicated problem. It's going to require everybody really putting their attention and their hearts and minds onto solving this issue. No one, and I mean no one, does a better job of commenting on relevant topics than Spike Lee. Well, that's it for this episode. Make sure to join us again behind the velvet rope.